doing a great job cool. so far. All right, so welcome. Yeah, we're recording. Cool. Um, yeah, so we don't have a ton on the agenda for the day. So let me um let me share my screen and we can we can hopefully start getting some people there. Actually, let me link to this. Um ba -ba -ba -ba. this is There we go. There's our notes for the day. Um, yeah, there's not a not a ton of stuff on the agenda. There's um, one thing from last week, very small. I'm sure it's just going to be like, okay, yes, we don't want to do that, but wanted to have it on there anyway. Um, yeah, recording this meeting starting today. I think uh, last week we we had some really in depth discussions um, that I think would have been really useful to have recorded and we weren't recording. So that's unfortunate, but we'll be recording going forward. Um, as long as, you know, everybody's good with that. Um, yeah. If you have any other agenda items, we, yeah, yeah. Just go edit it, add it, or let me know. And we can, I can add it on there. That's pretty much it for that. Uh, Alex just gave us an update that, uh, is it is it Javi? Yeah, Javi from Agalia started to look at uh, the too many web transport bug and started to work on sort of a design for that. So that's that's amazing. Uh, the Chrome bug is linked from this issue here. Um, yeah, there's an update, but at least it's it's um, getting attention now. So that's great. Yeah, the TLDR is that he's going to put he's going to prepare a design document that he's going to submit to Google. Um, so when that's ready, before he submits it, we should all take a look and make sure it, it makes a compelling argument and covers the the various use cases that will strengthen our position on why this should be done. Cool. Yeah, awesome. On that note, just a quick uh, question. Do we know if any like uh, other browsers intending to implement web transport at this point? Yeah, so there's then... a Firefox issue one second. Let me find. The, yeah, it was, it's in Firefox. And the thing that we were missing was the um, cert hashes constructor argument, which has been implemented. Um, but there was, there was a, yeah, maybe is it the thing Nidal's doesn't amount to link to, but there was a, there's also a, a Chromium bug tracker thing, uh, issue about that implementation. So I don't know if it's ready for prime time yet, but there is progress. Cool. Um, yeah, so we're recording. And yeah, so so there was a, this is sort of a common thread, I think, and there's different IPLD, you know, work to like auto, auto magically load different codecs and hashers and different things via WASM and, you know, all the stuff. But somebody asked in Slack about um, some CID that they tried querying using our service worker, uh, Helia service worker gateway. And it wasn't a hasher that we supported by default. So the question is like, um, what, oh, you already added that, uh, what path thing. Oh, this is in there. Okay, sweet. Yeah. So, yes. okay. So the web pathing covers some of the defaults that we should use. So that's the thing. We don't have any specification for this. Right? So how yeah. people are supposed to know which hashes to implement? Like, which hashes should the verified fetch implement? I don't know. That's why I uh, proposed we should have a spec. It's not like IPFS pathing, but let's just agree on the minimum set of codecs, hash functions, multi-base things that are like expected to be the bare minimum on, in like web contexts. And you know, if a function is too much, I'd say 
we remove or add it to the spec and then we try to follow the spec. Uh, otherwise, we will have different set of hash functions depending on which libraries are in each language, <laughs> right? Um, that's my thinking. Uh, I would say feedback on the spec draft and then try to implement the spec. Uh, that way we don't, it's not, not a problem of like verified fetch to be the, the decider. It's effectively specs and IPFS foundations problem of like governing decisions like this, right? We should That's be awesome. just following the, the specification. Yeah. And then, I mean, as long as we have a library or tool that somebody can deploy themselves, they can always customize, you know, those hashers for those cases. And we can push on that instead of trying to decide every time whether we want to add it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. There's a small uh, nuance. I don't, don't, don't want to go too deep in this, but just hinting. Um, so for example, in IPNS, when I was like writing a spec, this was a good question. So Kubo, I, effectively, like the first version of the spec is to document what is in production, and that was go IPFS slash Kubo. Okay, so what what key types are supported by Kubo? What you can actually use in command line to generate IPNS key and publish that key, and expect that to work on like eighty percent of the IPFS swarm, right? That's a factor. Like first things, document what exists, and then that's kind of like a standard, and then you try to switch from implementation-driven uh, protocol uh, evolution to like spec-driven. So one of the like soft decisions I made there was to not be overly prescriptive on what is required. Because the more you require from implementers, the harder it is to implement your protocol stack. So for example, in IPNS, the only required key type is the current default. And all the other ones are either like softly suggest, like, should instead of must or an optional. Um, so I don't know if the similar approach should be applied to web pathing spec. Should be, we say like you must implement SHA2 and you should implement Blake free. <laughs> uh, that's kind of like spec conversation I think we, ha we will have to have, uh, but I don't think that's a conversation, you know, verified fetch specific that's like an ecosystem specific yeah totally yeah i think you know it'd be really useful if we had some some metrics on like the flow of cids through the network and like what the most common like what's the p99 codec which i think you know you guys know is like unix fs right but like what's the p99 Multi base, multi hash. Um, yeah, we, we and we have that. We have uh, it's a good point. We have that information from like, we, or we could gather that information by observing IPFSIO and the web.link and trustless gateway link. Just root CIDs. What's the root of DAG? And what's yeah. the most popular hash function? And you can like infer from that. We don't have to look at all the blocks, we could just look at the root ones. Alan, the, um, the doc you link to has a list of hash functions on it. How did you arrive at that list? Uh, the one uh, from the web pathing thing or? No, this I one? think this one? Alex was asking oh, Alan. Yeah. Oh, okay. In different yeah, we, okay. yeah we, we saw them and gradually added them, I think. Um, I th actually, I think, yeah, we saw, so obviously we see the SHA-2 ones a lot, identity obvious. The We saw Blake because of file, we started to see Blake because of Filecoin and we needed to support that. I can't remember why the SHA-3 ones are there, but I'm guessing we decided they were forwards compatible and nor, nor the Murmur ones, I don't know. Um, but I know that the, yeah, the others, like I said, Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good question. And I see you have more more there. That might be a problem, but uh, that's probably a same conversation. I can't actually add a comment. Interesting. It's bugged out. Weird. 
Okay. Um, but yeah, we should we should definitely link to that because that's a good that's a good source. Um I was gonna say something else. Um oh yeah, so so I, I pinged Alex uh, about this. And it'd be great if anybody has any ideas, but uh, I was wondering, you know, if it would be dumb to try to like in this service worker configuration page. Um, I don't know if I still have. It. Yes, I do. So in this Helia service worker configuration um, that I've been putting together and trying to make it so people can, you know, customize the gateway or router for this service worker. I can go into that in more depth later. But anyway, I was wondering if we should have some sort of like code pin esque style uh, entry where you can add hashers or multi bases or something like this. And then we could dynamically import them. Um, service workers don't globally support dynamically importing modules right now. So I don't, I'd have to dive in further to see like how, how we could do that. But I think, you know, that's, that's a cool idea to extend at least this particular product, you know, gateway. If anybody has any ideas on that, um, feel free to chime in. But yeah. That could be really cool if we could just allow the users like, oh, hey, this this codec isn't supported. And then we could even modify the config for them immediately, you know, to add it. But I don't think we're there yet. Um. So yeah, do we want to move this discussion over to the web pathing spec? Do is there anything to decide now for like do we want to add Blake to be hashing to verified fetch now? Or to Helia Helia uh service worker gateway, I guess. Uh, is it like limit the fact that it's not like built in the Helia defaults? Or is it like specific to verified fetch at all? It's um so you can extend the hashers. And codecs and different things like IPLD Explorer components does that currently. Yeah, I I don't have strong opinion. It's kind of like a Piper cut. If you have a different set of things uh, in different places, working in different places, but that's that's effectively why we have that like pathing spec. Uh, um, I don't know. My take is to agree on the spec decide which ones are musts and which ones are shoulds and then like implementations can decide so I, I suspect like for Helia the shoulds will be an open discussion because you care about the bundle size and you probably want to minimize that the, the default one yeah. uh, for verified fetch probably lean as well but then for service worker gateway you want to like maximize uh, the amount of supported things because you like fetch that payload only once and you cache it forever. So that's just my intuition, how things will go. But I think, yeah, agree on the spec and add masts and shoots there. Uh, and yeah, yeah, Alan, especially like feedback from you, because I see there's like a different uh, set of uh, functions and you have a good uh, like signal from like real users who were using them. So I assume there was a reason for adding them. So feedback on anything that's missing from the spec would be useful. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I'm just asking about the memo ones. I think I'm not sure why they're, they're there for um, really. But honestly, the other ones are there because we've experienced them in the gateways and we've added the, in our, our gateway or the gateways that we run. Um, and that like, they've been added because of people actually using them in the wild. Um, and we haven't received any further, like as far as I know, we haven't received any requests for anything outside of the, this list um, or or complaints. Um, and we monitor the, the our kind of discord and, and issues really, really solidly. So yeah, uh, we used to have like, a, I don't know if we still have it, but we used to have a dashboard, which actually, we actually had that, um, that uh, graph of like you know uh, like uh, CID information all split out like you know versions um, 
hashes, IPLD codecs, and everything in terms of like percentage percentage wise that we're getting hit we're getting hit with. So um, we, we know this. Uh, it's not just a guess, but the murmur. I'm not really sure. I'm just checking with Ashko. Yeah, I'll check if we can like also look at it easily to Rainbow maybe. Uh, if not, we can extract that from uh, access logs from like past week. Uh, just to you know, when we make to add more uh, signal to that conversation, because I suspect there is like also like maybe that there are fast hash functions which were requested by by, by a single like person <laughs> uh, for a single like product, and the question is should like entire ecosystem pay the price of like requiring that, right? So yeah. Yeah, I mean we got a lot of feedback about bundle sizes being too big and there being too many esoteric hash functions and all this kind of thing. So we've minified everything and split everything out. And then if we have a spec that says that we have to put it all back in. Uh, interesting. Yeah, cool. So, so I think, yeah, for the service worker, uh, Helia service worker gateway and Helia HTTP gateway, we can, we can, um, kind of go off of what, uh, the car block validator is using for now. I think that'd be, that'd be a great starting point at least, uh, or be, you know, add them without much fuss if requested, I think, because those aren't really, you know, libraries that people are consuming. I mean, the service worker might be if we publish that as like a service worker plugin or when we do, but yeah. So I can, <laughs> excuse me, I can add that to the Blake to, to the service worker gateway. It's not a problem. Yeah, I think Alex had said something similar about the bundle size in the service worker not being as big of a concern. And I totally agree with both of you. Um, yeah, so Helio remote pinning, um, this, uh, doesn't work great and web three storage. Um, I mean, the library itself works great. Uh, um, but the pinning, pinning services themselves, uh, don't allow this to be extremely usable for our consumers. Um, there's, there's a number of different issues I documented in, um, uh, Helia examples, I think, uh, remote pinning. Yeah. So, yeah, so web three dot storage wasn't, um, returning browser dialable delegates. Also, I think it's sunsetting. So. If you're seeing this in video in the future, probably won't be using that. Alan could chime in more if he wants, but S where is gone a long time before I even realized. Uh Pinata does not like the like browser-based origins that we send. Crust requires a wallet and different things. And then it started failing on me and was, you know, I kind of stepped away from that one for a bit. I haven't had a chance to look at this for a long time. I think, you know, the last update was from Daniel, which I'm just now seeing. Yeah. Oh no, I saw this one January 4th. Um, but, but yeah, so the question is for this, this meeting, uh, uh, the Helio remote pinning, um, library is currently published under the Helio scope. Do we want to merge that to the mono repo or potentially like archive this repo, like change the scope that it's published under to something that's not under the helioscope? I think it's fine to publish it under the helioscope on NPM. I kind of question the longevity of the module given that all these remote pinning services are dying or killing themselves or whatever. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think we, maybe like a meta opinion <laughs> is that we should not be like investing time in 
uh, remote pinning until we have a standard for onboarding data over HTTP. So, because there are like two problems. One problem is delegates and origin. When you are in a browser, uh, that you have a data in a in a browser and you want to pin that to remote service. Right now, you could do that over BitSwap, but the problem is origins and delegates implementations are not working with unknown protocols. We introduced multiple new protocols. We changed Quick to Quick V1. We've added uh, web uh, transport and Pinata. I'm 99% sure it's the same bug that was like year, two years ago. They, they just see unknown protocol and just error instead of ignoring unknown protocols. So that's kind of like a problem for ecosystem to build like more robust things which expect the network to evolve and expect new unknown protocols to appear. Your software should just ignore unknown things. Uh, and the second problem is the onboarding of data where our, the current option right now is to use delegates and origin to establish connection and then use BitSwap to slurp the data from your browser node. And that's for and that's kind of like expensive for and complex for the pinning services. So there is no surprise they don't want to do that. The problem is we don't have standard for HTTP onboarding. So I think my closing thought on this is that until we have HTTP spec for onboarding of HTTP, being able to push car and kind of like services agree to implement the same thing, we won't be able to have a remote pinning. API that's like usable beyond a single service, right? Because this is if, if, the idea was that uh, this is like the generic API for pinning, and you can use it for no, no matter which service. It's not possible right now because you are not able to do the data transfer. Um, yeah, I th I think we should not spend time until we we have onboarding story, or if there's a uh, appetite to have a, a better API. I had a crazy idea the other day. And I'm mm. glad Alan's here actually, because maybe, because it affects, well, it doesn't affect, but like it might use something like Web3 storage, where if we, like the, the kind of the providing story in, in JS has never really been, we've always kind of shied away from it a little bit because it's so expensive in, in Goland. Um, but if we like only, provided the root of a DAG that we'd imported, like a file or whatever. And then we had a um, we had a router. So at the moment we've got like routers that do things like resolve IPNS records from, from a delegated routing API and that kind of thing, which is specific to IPNS records. But the idea is that you can have lots of these things and, and internally Helio is going to try them all. So you have one that just does the provide API from, from the routing API. And it has an instance of like the Web3 storage upload client. And it it's given the root CID and it has the block store and it can it can walk the DAG behind the CID and create a car and upload it to Web3 storage. So then it thinks, like the node thinks it's run provide, but really it's done the equivalent of remote pinning. And it's just like punted a car file of an entire DAG up to Web3 storage or like, you know, some other service, um, but completely transparent to the user. And then we don't really have to worry about a lot, like the remote pinning things being so sad. So if I understand correctly, the idea is to like, just use delegated routing API, but if you like, and use it for announcements. And But if you happen to announce to an endpoint of a pinning service that also does the pinning behind the scenes? Not specifically a pinning service, but yeah. So you're using the delegate, you're using the, the Helio routing, an implementation of the Helio routing API. So the provide method just ha so happens to upload the entire DAG to Web3 storage. Like the, the problem is that if you, if you import a DAG and you provide every single CID in the DAG, then you're doing lots and lots of like redundant uploads. But if you just, if we switch around, so we only ever provide the root of the DAG, like the root CID and none of the children, which is like, it's kind of, it's what some people think we're talking about doing a few years ago anyway, because, you know, if you're doing like sessions uh, for retrieval, then 
the kind of the vague assumption is that the people who have the root have the rest of the DAG. Does does provide not in the delegated routing sense? Does it does it upload blocks to some somewhere for every block or? In the, I, I'm not well, familiar with delegated routing provide. It's a no op at the moment for delegated routing. We ha we had a similar right. um, idea that where to because we weren't we were you know stopping support for pinning service that we'd actually have a um, we'd have a, a you know just a binary that you could run on your system that would expose a remote pinning service uh, pinning service API uh, endpoint on localhost. And then you could set up your IPFS node with localhost as your remote pinning service. And what it would do was uh, when you pinned something, it would just kind of extract the DAG from your IPFS instance and uh, and post off a car to web free storage. And I guess whoever, whatever provider is, like it, it doesn't have to be web free to storage, it could be anyone, but it's like this kind of sidecar that allows you to have this remote pinning local remote pinning service that you can with bridge between pinning service api which is sort of similar i think to what you're saying but um through a different interface yeah it sounds like there's more infrastructure involved there this is actually like going deep into the node to add the capability rather than yeah 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 exactly because i guess the Thanks, like yeah, so I was linked to the a spec for the post, uh, yeah, for doing provide, no uh, delegate provide. But maybe that's that's gonna let you say, hey, can you publish a provider record on my behalf, but then po point the record back at my multi added, which of course in browsers is used for like uh, they're too ephemeral. Whereas like what you're saying, like provide, you're like as long as someone provides. Then we're happy. So, like, if you uploaded it to Web three storage or something, then they would do the providing. And then, like, you know, people have to put their credit cards in and that kind of thing to get their uh, their plugin to work, and then everyone wins. But is, is the goal to so? So, I think with IPNI, you can actually just with your local node, you can just provide or be a provider for data, and you, as long as you sort of stay online every so often, it will return your node as a answer for a particular CID. Um, what kind of one is a better goal, is the goal to yeah, yeah is, the, is the goal to be able to your 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 particular IVS node to respond to requests or is it to keep the data alive it within the network via some other always on node? The latter. It's like it's basically to try and make publishing yeah. from browsers a nicer experience. So I'd, I'd probably not go for, like go through that route via the providing, like a providing API, because that's, it seems to be for your own node to say, I provide this rather than someone else is providing this. I'd let other people do that. I'd just send your data to an always on node that you, you know, you, you're, you're happy to host your data for whatever reason. That is the pattern of remote pinning, but unfortunately, yeah, no one's doing it anymore. <laughs> so we have to be a little more sneaky. Yeah, well, yeah, it's 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 a tough it's a tough business thing, I think. Um, I mean, when we're free dot storage was free free, even even now that's not even like even with a paid uh a paid a, you know pay paywall where you get like a certain amount for free if you're asked to pin a thing and you're not and the remote service is not able to determine like how big it is or um until it's fetched it all then it's kind of problematic um i know for unix fs data maybe you could have a remote pinning service that would only allow Unix FS data. But still that can I think the sizes there can be meddled with to trick it into downloading stuff. But when we had a free service, we had people pinning huge files and then hoping that they would get pinned and our nodes would be super busy 
trying to fetch things that from other people on the internet that weren't necessarily who was pinning it. Um, and then, you know, they might not necessarily stay online and they might not, the, the data might just not be there, meaning that it would try and find that thing, that piece of content for forever, basically. I mean, IPFS clusters doesn't have a, or at the time didn't have a, uh, fail after a certain amount of time or, um, or, or tries, uh, I think it's maybe different now. I mean, could you like limit the size of the car file that can be uploaded? That would stop people from sending you too much data. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, okay, but so that's, I mean, with pinning service API, it's all over bit swap. With car file uploads, which is what web free storage so does now, you explicitly ask it, you say, I want to store this CID of some content, and you tell it the size that it's going to be, and it gives you back a URL where you put the data. And when you put the data, it can only be the size that you said it was going to be, and it can only hash to the hash, the CID that you said you were going to upload. So um, at the point that you ask to store data, you can you can kind of allocate that amount of storage somewhere and, and be sure that you'll have enough space. You can um, you, you know make sure that that particular user has uh, paid for that much space, perhaps in, in up front um there's 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 this transactional guarantee there which is kind of is kind of nice that um unfortunately the pinning service api doesn't doesn't have in the attack it service does. there oh yeah sorry it, the pinning service api does have the benefit of like it works over bit swap so if you want to uh, if you want to pin something that you don't have or you want to pin something that is like uh, something mutated and it's just a it's changed from a previous thing that you uploaded then then you know pinning service api really shines there but uh unfortunately the vector for abuse is um uh, it's just um it's hard uh and you add the complexity of like you could be in this intermediate state that is never resolved. And so it's like, even just reasoning about that for the user is this weird thing because it's like, oh, did you pin it or not? Well, I pinned it, but it hasn't been pinned. So it's like a pending pin. And then yeah. you have to explain all of this. But I, I had a question regarding uh, the car upload sort of endpoint. So from what you said is you, when you create the delegation and say the user uploads it directly, you're already, that delegation has been created for a specific SID of a specific size. Um, yeah. What I'm curious there is, what is sort of the cost that you pay on, say, an attack on that? So say when the user, say, uploads a different car, how much of that car do you need to, like, already stream before you can reject the request? And when I say stream, I mean, like, the user uploading. So because it already knows the, the hash of the data, I assume that it the... Yeah, I don't know. I th maybe you do have to receive the whole thing to be able to to ensure that the hash is hash hash the same thing. But if you like upload a car, uh, so one thing is you can have like optional route at the top. You all can also look at the CIDs as they arrive. Uh, so the, the... not not in like the web free storage case. Like we don't. And because the target is just is not something that's IPFS aware, it's just content addressed aware. Mm -hmm. uh, it does have a like you know a single upload limit of like four gig, four or five gig, I think it is. Um, so it's not going to be the end of the world. But the yeah, and for the large part, our our um, uh, infrastructure is. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously there's there's a yeah, scope yeah. for attack. I, I was like more it. like curious. Are you are you like at least like that? If someone uses your your tooling, are your like cars ordered in a way that like, the route is at the front, so you can like quickly start like walking the dog, or are you like not even like? We don't care about the dog. Okay. <laughs> oh, you um, have like cars. No... Yeah, you have those like car CIDs, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. I mean, it's just the hash of the 
content. That's what we're store we say. So you you take it's just a hash of the car file. Yeah, yeah. And so the car file car is codec. itself the data you put. You don't care what's inside. Yeah, and there's blocks yeah. in there, and they all have hashes too. Uh, but that, that's the idea, and it, and then actually we're not restricted necessarily to to car uploads. It can be any any content. Hey, so data, really. essentially, it is a, a just a hash of the whole car file. It's not the root hash that is in the yeah. header of the yeah. car file. Okay, yeah, yeah, gotcha. And actually, the actually actually the way we. Uh, we split like we shard DAGs to into like hundred meg slices because uh, to, to try and um, so in the browser people try and upload huge files and they can't necessarily make uh, DAGs uh, store them in their entirety within memory. Each tab in a browser gets about I think two gig or something um, to to play with. So in order to um, to allow people to upload huge files from the browser, we actually create the DAG, we streamingly create the DAG, so from the bottom up. And uh, we once we have enough blocks to fill that 100 meg chunk, then we'll send off that car and then that chunk of memory can be freed and we can build up another one and send off another car. And in that way, it means that our car, we don't actually have a root CID until the very last car uh, that we send because it's the end of the, you know, it's the top level of the DAG. That's the only one that has has a root CID, but we don't really care that much about the root CID. We index the blocks in the car, and then, like, we'll give the root CID to the user uh, so that they can access their data. But it's really about the the blocks and the the SIDs of the blocks that are that's important. Yeah. Um, cool. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Um, any. Any other questions on that? Uh, we've been so I I love that uh, Lytle was saying, hey, we shouldn't really focus on remote pinning. And then like most uh, <laughs> like the last 30 minutes or so now we've been talking about remote pinning. It's great. Um, but I think it's extremely valuable context to understand like the problems that that um, Web3 dot storage solved and how they solve them and and different areas it's extremely valuable to have you here alan so thanks for joining it's, it's just one way to do it like it's not i'm not saying it's yeah. the, the best or, or the only way it's just that sure. we, we've done it at, with a um, you know fair amount of scale and this is the what's worked for us i think just um yeah yeah like i mean there are there are cert certain other things that you can do that that work really well for probably a whole bunch of users um scale um but we just had too much that we had to really restrict things and, and keep things simple. Yeah. yeah. And, and at this point, you are also the biggest pinning service. So, I mean, your lessons are useful. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, and not, not every, like, but, you know, the, not everyone is, is what, web free storages or nft storages like many applications are not like not going to have to worry about things that we we have to worry about necessarily totally and like i said you know the pinning service api we, we weren't able to make it work but that like it has huge benefits and like under like bit swappers are in on the whole is it's great like the the simplicity and um, yeah yeah, it's really cool. Uh, I like, you know, it means that we could we could implement like a bit swap peer in JS that is just bit swap. It's just bit swap. It doesn't do anything else, and it's so simple because the bit swap protocol is so simple. If you're a server, uh, it's like get a message. I want the blocks. Get the blocks. Send the blocks. Get another message. I want the blocks. Get the blocks. Send the blocks. There's no. It's really simple. And then you know you have client side concerns like as the on the other side. You have concerns like who am i going to get the blocks from like what if they stop sending me the blocks i'm going to have to talk to someone else and like sessions and stuff that you have in kubo right but you don't have to worry about any of that as a as a ser like server remote read only bitswap peer like it's, it's just it's really simple and in fact we run it we run bitswap peer and cloudflare workers now and it's it works fine that's awesome cool uh I had like very short thought, maybe like why I think uh, there will be like a natural point in the 
like ecosystem evolution where we will be maybe like not forced, but there will be like a natural time to pick this up. So for example, we are working on a verified fetch right now, which is effectively HTTP GET, right? And um, natural question someone may ask next is like, can I do post or put with verified fetch? So this is a surface where we have a very nice like abstraction, which hides details like pinning and stuff. Maybe like users or devs should like should not care about pinning APIs and all those things. Maybe that's something the user agent or some like a library abstracts away. You just use the fetch API, just post data to IPFS, and then your user agent decides. Is it like stored on your local machine? Is it also replicated to some pinning services? Uh, so those are like open questions. I feel we may be in a better position with abstractions sometime in the future after we figure out the HTTP GET story in the, on the web. Is verified fetch, um, that's the trustless gateway. Is that right? So uh, uh, yeah, I, I would say no, but, but yes. Um, it's, it's backed supposed... by it's backed by in uh, the default mode, but that's a yeah. very sim oversimplified answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's using the trustless gateways to fetch the data <laughs> for sure. Um, by by default, it's using um, Helia HTTP. Um, yeah. So you get you get back like whoever you talk to, you need to get back a card that's in depth first order block order and. And stuff like that, or like actually doing it block by block. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Currently, yeah, currently. So he, Helia, the implementation we like. So there was only the 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 way that you would get blocks is via bit swap, and so we added an abstraction in Helia called block brokers, where um, you know trustless gateways and bit swap sit, you know, as siblings. And so currently the only block brokers we have other than BitSwap is just the block by block trustless gateway fetching. You know, I think we have some work to do there where maybe we're fetching cars instead in some scenarios and, you know, controlling that a little bit more, but right now it's just block by block, like um, raw requests, I think. I don't know. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I, if, I mean, if you, Probably the idea is if you want to focus on like getting the fetch like user experience, and then we can we can gut it and reshape it however we want internally, uh, as long as the user have the nice like Chrome around it. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so the web free storage gateway implements a trustless gateway that. Um, so Lassie uses it in Saturn to fetch data, um, but it's, it's, I guess, similar. Um, it, when it asks for a CID, it constructs a car where the car is like dynamically created based on the DAG that's being requested. Uh, just you get like a car with the blocks in the order that you kind of would need to traverse them to to extract whatever thing you're trying to extract. Um, yeah. <laughs> Got nothing else to add there, but like, yeah, it, it, it doesn't sound like you're too far off having a thing that, you know, because obviously you're getting stuff in the order that you need it. Yeah, do you is this uh, but instead something... of having multiple fetches it's not, it's you'll get not... just one fetch that with a car that has all of the blocks in it that you expect to get and so you're using that library now with web3 dot storage the the last yeah so or javascript uh, uh, oh no it's the um lassie is using the trustless gateway oh okay the, yeah yeah web free storage exposes so the, the, uh, yeah, if you yeah, if you request a car with I think you can specify like ordering 
parameters for the blocks. Uh, you can do range uh, like like range requests as well, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah. Yep. And it it does like it does like the the Merkle proof as well. So if you request like a SID and then a path, it will give you the blocks that you need to prove that what it is your the file you're downloading came from that root. Yeah. That. Yeah. That's yeah, that's that's awesome. Alex has been been filling out all of the guts of verified fetch with a lot of these nuancey things. Um, I don't know if we have DFS and other support yet, but but we've got most of the the content types in PR right now, or or maybe merged. Um, but yeah, it's it's coming along. Um, I. I did want to chat about like I mean the this this post um I pip I'm excited about the browser story of providing content like I'm excited about you know whether that's pinning services or not um I really think like the preload nodes had people convinced that they were providing content from JS IPFS in the browser for years right so if we could get that same level of magic happening like with with nodes that we don't have to pay for and, and host, just the network does it. Like any Kubo node is essentially a potential preload node. That would be great. I'm afraid there are like legal ramifications of that model. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what some people wanted IPFS to be when, when Filecoin was announced too? Is like, hey, I want to be able to like use storage from any of the nodes on this network right and then like if if you run a node you you're essentially like agreeing to like potentially provide a peers bit swap want list you know announce that and right i think that's, so that's what like, a lot of people thought it was but yeah <laughs> yeah i don't yeah i think like maybe like uh the main innovation of IPFS was uh, of, on top of, the, let's say, the initial like, Go IPFS implementation. The main innovation, I think, was uh, it respected user agency in that while other peer-to-peer -peer software automatically the, the, or, or networks uh, that were created at the time, they did the thing where you were automatically co-hosting other people's stuff without having any say. You could maybe like allocate a quota, but you could not decide. What it did differently was that you are only providing and co-hosting content that you explicitly cared. So even you browse something that loads in the cache that gets reprovided, but you reprovide content which kind of like was relevant to you and you can like pin it to keep it from eviction for longer. Um, but it was like important aspect of user agency uh, or when we started talking about it in the browser context, like, like you co-host websites that you visited. Um, and the, that translates to things like, oh, the most popular websites get automatically like scaling for free because people who visit contribute to that. Uh, if we... And you know now we have multiple implementations of IPFS, and we may have uh, like projects and uh, uh, and, and uh, which have different assumptions about that. But it should be like very clearly communicated to end user that hey, you will be by definition co-hosting other people's content because uh, there's like a, you know there are legal ramifications. Some things may be legal in one country, may not be legal in another one. Uh, the fact that if you like run go IPFS uh, now Kubo. Uh, all right, like IPFS desktop, you know, you will not be suddenly hosting stuff, uh, which you may not want to. I think that's like an important uh, value for user agency. Um, yeah, I don't think uh, so. Maybe like the the the, the thing that uh, uh, some people ask, like why public gateway at IPFS IO does not accept post. <laughs> we had like uh, writable gateways. Why IPFS IO is not writable? Because we cannot like, it's, it's the problem we had with preload nodes. You 
they kept data for a while and then it got garbage collected and that made, made things worse because things worked and then they stopped working and people did not understand why. So that may be a question of a clear SLA, like, oh, we will pin your content for one hour. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's the model for like a public gateways. Um, when we get, when we get WebRTC, uh, like, uh, distributed throughout the network more fully do we do we think browser nodes will be viable like peers in the network for providing content like for the average user not for like power or abusive users that are trying to i don't know load you know all of their google drive stuff over to ipfs how long are you staying on a tab <laughs> I mean, yeah, so it depends if if I need to go to Helia.ui, you know, and keep that running as a progressive web app or or whatever, or open in a little window, you know, I would I would leave that running for forever if I could just have a node running without installing a binary. I think others would do similar. Yeah, so it's it it depends. Like you know, if you are like watching a video and streaming that for like an hour, you could be like providing at the same time, but. I, I, I have what? nine browser tabs open, like browser windows open. Each window has like 10 tabs. Yeah, it's not. At least. It's a conservative asset, uh, you know, estimate. And, uh, you know, so Chrome has started unloading ones that aren't the main, like the currently selected ones. So I've got at least nine. <laughs> yeah, it's more uh, that I think the direction, at least like short to mid term, will be browser nodes leveraging WebRTC to connect to peer, to more like desktop peers rather than big content providers um, through things like WebRTC Direct. Uh, browser to browser, it's nice for certain types of apps when you need like close to real-time collaboration, but I don't think it, they will be like meaningful providers over bigger periods of time. That's more. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that anybody will want to run like a browser node to to be like their primary node. Like if somebody's a power user hosting IPFS content, they're they're likely going to have a, you know, their own home lab server running, you know, providing that content. But I, the majority of users are really just trying to, hey, I created something. I want to like get it on IPFS so someone else can can access it. And maybe maybe Daniel can speak to that more. He's a little more involved with the customers, but that's that's what I've seen from a lot of people. Who are like, hey, I just want to, I just want to, you know, share my NFTs or access my NFTs. Like, how how can I do that easily? And people like IPFS desktop works great, but people like going to IPFS desktop and then downloading that and then trying to to do things there is, I've seen a pain for some users, you know. So having it just a, a web app. Um, would be extremely useful. But, but yeah, it makes sense. Some of the concern, like they're not going to, I mean, you only have like two gigabytes of memory, like Alan said earlier anyway. So, you know, you can't, you can only do so much. But I think that's understood. Anyway, that was a fun combo. Um Web pathing spec. Yeah, we should we should look at this. If you guys haven't, any anybody watching this video, wherever that ends up, I'm sure we'll make an announcement and, and chat about uh, where that is. But um, yeah, the web pathing spec is going to help us really define more about how like IPFS pathing works for the web. And is it fair to say that this is um going to inform maybe the the protocols that browsers might implement eventually like how they implement the ipfs protocol yes yeah so to be very clear uh this was i created this draft to have an artifact which can shorten some documents that we share with browser vendors um the uh, uh, i believe john from little bit labs um oh asks for ask for which hashes should we support which codecs are like what's the minimum set of things you need for webs for majority of websites to work in ipfs chromium project um and you know the same question is now in verified fetch same question maybe in in brave uh and that's why uh, 
we have this. Uh, it's just like a minimal set and did not call it IPFS pathing because it's like strictly about those web contexts. Yeah, and and more closely related to the work we're trying to do with the IPFS DAPS working group, right? Cool. Yeah, yeah, it's effectively uh, if you can, if you want to have like a mental model, how IPFS colon slash slash and IPNS colon slash slash should work like five, ten years from now, because the behavior we will decide def define on gateway HTTP gateways and in tools like Verified Fetch and in IPFS Chromium will effectively set ossified like subset of standards that will survive over time. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Lido. Uh, we are one minute over. I think we can call it. Um, we talked about a lot today. So thanks, everyone. Um, if there's, if anybody has anything, speak now or forever. Hold your tongue. I don't know. <laughs> Wait until the next session. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks for joining. Um, thanks, Russell. Yeah, no problem. See you. See you guys later. Yeah.